Hey, um, welcome to our latest uh, Instagram Live. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you for joining. Um, very happy to see those who were there last week when we had uh, Brian Brader talking. Uh, and this week we have Kevin Lyons. Uh, Kevin is a uh, creative director, illustrator, and artist, and he also created the iconic giant step logo so i'm going to bring kevin on and we're gonna we're gonna start a chat and here we go waiting on kevin he's about to appear and he's here we go there we go hi kevin hello how are you doing Good. I'm going to try to configure myself a little bit. How are you, Murray? I'm, I'm pretty good. You look like you're uh, ready for the, uh, the, 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 the snowstorm. <laughs> I'm always ready for the snowstorm. <laughs> I have the Bill Murray uh, kind of feel. You got the Bill, Murray, the Bill Murray deal going on. Yeah, the, what was the movie when he... Uh, Life Aquatic. Oh, there you go. Yeah, great, great movie with um, with Sujourge as well in there. Yes. Oh, yeah, great soundtrack. Yeah, awesome soundtrack. Um, so, Kevin, thank you so much for agreeing to do uh, the IG Live, um, celebrating 30 years of Giant Step. Um, and, you know, besides you obviously being a uh, award-winning, distinguished uh uh, creative director, illustrator, artist, etc. You also designed the iconic Giant Step logo. So we couldn't celebrate 30 years of the company without sort of getting to the source of, of you know, of our logo and um, your inspiration behind that. But I don't want to start there. Um, I really want to start by us understanding, you know, who Kevin Lyons is and how Kevin, you, you became a, uh, the artist that you are because everything has to start somewhere um how did you get obsessed with drawing creative your creative path what, what, what how did that start for you well i'm getting a little feedback on the phone but you yeah so you know what i think it's because i am not i don't have my head my headphones and are connected to my computer so, yeah yeah got it so uh, just give me one second. Yeah, yeah. No. Should be back now. Is that better? Yeah, that's better, I think, right? Yeah, you don't yes. hear me. Perfect, yeah. I forgot to plug my head, I uh, forgot to change my headphones from my computer to my phone. I thought you sounded quite quite soft as well, so. So I'll, I'll ask the question again, because we, we paused, unfortunately. So how did you get, how did you get started? What, tell us about your background. A young Kevin, what was well, a young Kevin a young like? Well, Kevin was like, uh, was basically obsessed with drawing and it really began there. Like I was obsessed with, cartoons and animation and logos i was like uh all i did was like play sports and draw and so a lot of what i used to do was like you know copy uh corporate logos like i would draw the logo like corporate logos meaning like sports logos or sports teams i would design my own uniforms my own sneakers um i was a sneaker head before that was like something and i was just obsessed with footwear and then i would also i was obsessed with music when i drew so i would often do like i would mimic album covers or i would like redraw album covers and redraw it, it was a lot of like looking at stuff and sort of drawing it and just sitting there and drawing it so in all my spare time i was either playing sports or i was kind of drawing and then when i was doing both or really when i was drawing i was listening to music at the same time so i sort of became you know, involved with that at the same time. And that fueled, you know, wanting to make mixtapes and do zines and silk screen. And then suddenly like I'm silk training t-shirts in high school and making my own logos for things and that type of thing. So it, it was really natural, but it wasn't like, I saw it as a career path. It was, it was very much like something I couldn't stop doing. What were you listening to when 
when you were do, doing these drawings? What 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 was the music? Well, this was, was for... this was the eighties, so I was listening to like Blondie, um, the Talking Heads. Uh, you know, one of the first record, like first seven inch I think I ever had was The Tide Is High by Blondie. Um, the Talking Heads I was obsessed with, which helped influence my path because I, I went to RISD. A, a lot of the reason was because I knew that the Talking Heads had gone to RISD. And, Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up uh, in, I was born in Connecticut and raised in New England. So we moved around a little bit, but uh, Boston, outside of Boston. And then uh, I went to high school in Portland, Maine. To, like, mm -hmm. cause I, was in, I went to a, like a boarding school and then wound up at Rhode Island School of Design for college afterwards. And, and sports wise, you were obsessed with, you were playing sports, but you were also obsessed with sports teams. So what were the sports that you were playing? And what, what, what were some of the teams that you were? Yeah, no, I mean, I was, uh, my, my gr gr uh, grandfather had played minor league baseball for the Yankees. So even though I wow. grew up in New England, I sort of hated the Red Sox. So I was a big Yankees fan and the Red Sox were terrible. And everyone loved them. So I really, it, it was always this resistance, right? It was always this punk thing of like, even in sports, I was like, everyone loves that team. So I'm going to like the team that they all hate. Um, but I was playing like baseball and soccer as a kid. But then I, I sort of fell in love and had a natural ability to run. So I became like a long distance runner, which I still am today. And that's also affected my life's journey in, 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 in many ways. Um, but yeah, I became an obsessive runner, very good runner. And like that sort of t took over everything I did. So it was this sort of like, I went to a high school because it was a running high school, but it happened to have a great art program, which I was really lucky to fall into. So there was always this weird balance where art was like hard to escape. No one else in my family was into art or did art. It was just something where I realized at a very early age that I could draw and it was like something that made you popular or whatever. And so, you know, I would even do like dungeons and like kids would pay me stuff like do dungeons and dragons maps and castles for them. And like, I get paid to do people's book reports and things like that, like paid like 50 cents to a dollar at that time. But, Pretty good but I can rack yeah. up some money that way. <laughs> so did you did you actually believe that you could make a living out of your obsession with drawing or did you figure that you were this is when you were younger obviously before you knew yeah places I, didn't like think, I didn't think so and like uh, back then like you didn't know that like graphic designers were behind all of these sports teams and stuff yeah. you just thought these logos magically appeared and especially with like most of the sports logos, they weren't churning like they do now where they redesign every time. So near high school, like I said, I had a really good art teacher who like was, you know, started to like put me down that path. And I applied to all these schools thinking I was going to go to like an Ivy League school and just do whatever generic thing. And I applied to one art school on the, on the cusp that I might get in. And once I got in, it really made me think like, oh, maybe I can do this for a living. Maybe this is a real thing. Whereas I think now my own daughter, who's a freshman in, in college, she's at Micah, like she knew right away, to, like she started to figure it out when she was a sophomore in high school and she always knew that. I just didn't know that. I didn't know. My parents weren't, like they were like, you know, you can't make a living doing that. Right. So that's why I went into like design at first, you know, right. like because my family More practical. Felt safe my parents thought it was safe and i was already making logos in high school i was doing things for like little record companies and um, making flyers for like little shows and then making my own t-shirts and stuff like that so and then when i went to rizzi i met all these guys all the friends that i have now that are all making the same thing like i was in the freshman class um with shepherd fairy you know with these guys named urban folk art who are still friends I'm friends with today that make their own shirts and print stuff and like, you know, and suddenly we all got together and we were all silk screen. We were making our own like stop the violence movement t-shirts and we were making our own like band t-shirts of like bands that we couldn't buy a t-shirt from. And, and, um, and so you suddenly realize like, Oh, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe there is a living in this. Um, so that was like, that was the epiphany that was like, maybe I can turn this into a real job, you know? So just a question about Ridsley. Um, 
when you had to uh when you did your you know audition for for the school did they make you i, I heard that they used to make people uh draw a bicycle is that yeah. is that true is it, yes um yeah. they did and they changed that like four years ago which is kind of a shame my daughter applied there and did were not. You, were you aware uh, that you had to draw a bicycle when you, so you had I to I did have to draw a bicycle. And there were a hundred, I mean, <laughs> they must have thousands of bicycle drawings. But yeah, it was like part of the assignment is you had to draw a bicycle. And so um, at that time, I was very much like a true, like trying to draw perfectly everything. So my bike was very much like an unstylized, like I would do something so different now. But at the time, I just tried to make the like, best drawing I ever could of a bicycle. Um, and it was of my like 10 speed bicycle that I own. So it was very like traditional. I was probably on the more traditional side. And, you know, I, I'm sure there are lots of people who do much more creative things. But at that time, I wasn't, I was very much a, in that design mentality. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make something original, or I'm going to be an artist. It was more like I could be a commercial artist and I can replicate things and copy things. Um, and that was very like, that was my education because I wasn't coming from this big art background. So I had I think, books that I would sit and copy stuff out of. You know? I think it's amazing that you kind of like, you went to the school and you were with this group of, of creatives who really changed uh, you know, graphic design and art in the United States for, for, for a generation. And um, especially you know, the grad school, when I went to Cal Arts, that was an experience that was totally different. And those, that group of people and the, and the teachers that were taught status project, natural born, the old line, um, <laughs> it, that, that really influenced that. But even the kids that were at like, I mean, Eben Heath was another mm -hmm. artist that you worked sure. with at length, um, who, was, who I met at RISD, mm -hmm. who's how I met the Triple Five Soul, like Camella mm -hmm. at Triple mm -hmm. Five Soul, and eventually how I met a lot of different people. I met Blue Valdemir through a friend at RISD, who I, I worked on his films with them, and that's how I met Futura and Stash. And um, I met another kid there that introduced me to Todd James, who I lived with for a very short time in New York, but then I, you know, I, 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 I met him through him. So it's like this weird conglomeration of these RISD guys that all matriculated to New York, like I did, or came from New York and went to RISD. And then we all sort of found ourselves there because it's very small. And then basically like, you know, we made it that way. And that's how I met Russell Carabin. Someone's pointing out, mm -hmm, sir, yeah. but mm -hmm. I met him in those early days as well. And that I wound up working for him and with him for 10 plus years in a row, you know. When, I mean, when you, when you were first meeting these guys and you're all like, you know, you, you've got your dreams, you're struggling, you, you know, you just want to do it. Did you feel there was something special about like a Shepherd or an, or an Eben or, or even, what, even did you feel that what you were doing was special? Because like I said, you guys did, did become the benchmark for, for what came next. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, like you were hustling all the time. So I knew Eben was talented and I, I, I understood that. Um, and I knew like Shepard was prolific at the time. Would I know that he would go into like the stratosphere like that? Uh, no, you don't know that because he's just, he's right beside you. So it's like, it's like you knowing some of the artists that you knew, you never knew that they were going to become, you know, like the roots weren't going to become the house band for the new David Letterman. Like there's no way to project something like that when they're just playing on your stage at 20, but, 20 years but, old. But, but, but you did, but you did, I, I did get a sense when I would, when I first met Questlove, for example, right. you could it tell was that, that it was like, you yeah. know, this, this guy, yeah. I mean, you know, cause he is a bit of a savant quest love and you, you know, he's, he was so focused yeah. and driven that it was like, this guy is going to go somewhere. Either he's yeah. going to die of a heart attack for working his ass off or he's yeah. going to go somewhere. And that's, and that's what, that's the sense you got from, from like a shepherd or, and like I knew future, when I met Futura, it was like a dream come true. Right. And when I first met Eric Hayes, that was the dream come true. I knew those guys were on that level, on that next level. Yeah. And 
and so therefore those guys were the guys and then when i met stash and russell like i i respected them as peers and like i looked at them and said like wow they're in, they're insane I, I hope to be at that level as well but you knew there were a few of them that were just already established and then when i met camilla and saw what triple five soul was that was eye-opening too because i was like the closest thing to that at that time was like Sean Stussy was working out in LA and doing that. And then like the pop shop had been open for years and I worshiped yeah. Keith Haring, like worshiped Keith Haring. He was like a benchmark for me. And, and Eric Hayes was a benchmark for me because they were designers. They were graphic designers. They were making letter forms. They were making logos, but they were also like these other artists doing their own stuff and they were entrepreneurs. So, they were the roadmaps that I was like, maybe I can do this on my own. Now, I personally always needed a benefactor. I needed someone like Russell took me along or Blue Valdemir at that time was doing a line and he financed that. That was, was uh, I could that never was, pay for my own thing, but. Uh, yeah, cause I, I, I wanted to ask you about your influences and you, you, you mentioned Eric and you mentioned Futura because they were kind of like the generation before you guys and they yep. were really a proof of concept. How yeah. they were taking the you know graphic design. They were they were remixing. They yeah. were putting original things in there. They'd come from a graffiti background. Did you come from a graffiti background? I was not a graffiti artist. To this day, I can't. I I don't spray paint well, and so I stay away from it. Deadly Dragon. Um, I I stay away from it uh, because I'm not that good at it. Um. I'm sure, I you're, very good. I'm sure you're better than me. I was like a fan. <laughs> I was a fanboy of it, but I it came much more from the sneaker heavy design kind of background and went that direction. So I came from like flyers and punk and that stuff. And I, I never, I, I wasn't that, but that's what enamored me with like Eric is that he was drawing letter forms. He was going bombing trains, but he was drawing letter forms at this highest level and making these logos. And Future was just prolific at that moment, like just doing everything. And when I met like guys like Stash and Russell, who were just great kind of graphic minds, as well as doing other stuff out there, like that was, you know, Stash and I have always been these kindred spirits because we always joke that like in the early days, we were always the nerds on the computer doing the designs with everybody, but they, their brand was out there, but we were kind of behind the scenes, like trying to make the shit work and redraw the letters, and redraw the form and, um, and that type of thing. And so he was a kindred spirit. And then of course, Eben, which leads kind of into that giant step world, like Eben was someone who I met and was the kindred spirit. He was someone who was like deeply involved with jazz, deeply involved with New York and yeah. He introduced me to Camella, of course, and, and he already knew the parties when I arrived there. So it was very much like that scene was sort of like becoming something for me. Yeah. Um, I think I met Eben when he was actually in high school. Um, probably. Uh, yeah. yeah it, he, I think the first time I met him, he was he was dating um, an MTV DJ and he came into the restaurant that I was working at and I, I think I'd met him before and I was just so blown away that he, he was dead and I knew he was younger than me yeah <laughs> I think it was Lisa Edelman uh Lisa Edelson the uh, yeah yeah now she's an actress um that's uh, Evan yeah yeah I was very impressed um but he, um, he is naturally impressive at everything he does yeah. So, yeah, I agree. Including, you know, socializing and whatever. Yes. But, um, but like he was someone that like we vibed on a different level also because my musical taste was quickly morphing from like within RISD, you know, when I arrived at RISD, it was like Public Enemy was who I was into because I came from punk and Public Enemy, I found in like a record rack when I was looking at Puck, I was like, oh, this is the next Bad Brain. Some record store that I was in had put the Public Enemy album in the hardcore section because it was so loud and so hardcore. Yeah, total hardcore, yeah. And the first hip hop show I ever saw was like Schooly D. So I was really into like this punk version of what hip hop was. And then as I got into hip hop, like uh, Three Feet High and Rising dropped like my freshman and sophomore year at RISD. And that sort of was the gateway into the, the sampling and into jazz. And I started just buying more jazz and Eben was already into jazz. So 
And then I quickly learned about, you know, I was super into Neville Brody as a designer. Mm -hmm. And I knew of Ian Swift at a very uh, early stage. Of a his AKA, AKA Swifty for those. AKA who, Swifty, yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight yeah. No yeah. Chaser, yeah. Um, Talking Loud, Full Works. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly I was like, whoa, as soon as, soon as those records started coming out, I was starting to feast on what was, I had never been to a, as a jazz club or anything in Providence, there was nothing like that. I had not been to, this is even in 91, like I hadn't been to a giant step. I didn't even know it existed at that moment. Anymore. It hardly existed at that moment. Yeah, it hardly <laughs> existed, but the party, like that music was starting to permeate. And I knew who Giles Peterson was and I knew who Ian was. And like suddenly vibing hip hop, we were start starting to buy the original record. Who's calling me? The what? My son just tried. My oh. son just tried to call me. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so, so anyway, I, that took me into the realm of like kind of landing, coming out of RISD and going, moving to New York, and and uh, you know, I I was like, I didn't what, know what I was. What year? Do. What year was, was that? What year did you come to New York? That was ninety two. That was that summer I met you. The summer of ninety two. Um, and and, and I th I think we need to. Um, just uh, tell the story of how, because just to be clear, it wasn't like we contacted you. No, Kevin, what a great, you had no you're, idea you're an awesome who I designer. Was. We no love idea. you to design. So I think I'll let you tell the story. Um, I was just, I was basically a kid with a backpack who was unemployed and walking around New York City. And any time that I got a little job doing a logo or something, I would spend it on records. And this was the summer of 92. Uh, I had a Timberland backpack that I just went everywhere. It had my sketchbook in it. It had a change of clothes and it had my pens and whatever else in it and a bottle of white out. And I just used to trudge around. And back then, I don't think people realized like paper magazine was the gospel. Downtown Bible. To downtown Bible. Yeah. and nightlife and music and like fashion. It, it, it fashioned Art, everything. everything. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And the two editors were amazing. And that mm -hmm. was an amazing magazine. And I was flipping through the back of it. And I knew that there was this giant stuff. I knew there was Groove Collective was a band. And I actually, my favorite record store at that time is I used to spend a lot of time at Rebel Rebel. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, which, which bought all of the talk and loud. It was the only place I could find that. And I'm sure there were other places in New York, but for me, that was the Very place. Very few, yeah. To find it. And the guy who ran it was great to me because he knew I didn't have a lot of money. So he would be like, oh, this Galliano is fire. If you, if you have $40 spending on this, <laughs> I shouldn't have been spending $40. <laughs> yeah, you, no food, but you had a yeah, Galliano Yeah, no food, record. like pizza, <laughs> and that's it. Like a slice of pizza and water, and that's about it. And... Literally, I looked in the back of the paper and you guys had put out like a, ha a quarter page ad that said um, uh, Groove Collective, you know, uh, I think blah, Groove, blah, 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 Groove blah. Academy. I think it was. Yeah, Groove same. Academy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was Groove Academy. And there was a, I can't remember what the vinyl release was. I know I still have the vinyl, but there's no way in my archives I'm going to find it like that. Yeah. Um, I looked at the address and instead of sending in money for it or whatever else you might do, I walked to your address. I think you were on Barrick Street, right? Yeah. So we were we were actually we were inside SOB's offices yes. upstairs yeah. from SOB's. We kind of had a what started yeah. off as a desk and then grew into half the office. So I, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I walked into the hall there and I asked for Giant Step and they must have thought I was like I had my backpack. They must have thought I was like a messenger bike messenger or something so i walked up i walked into your office and i basically like you guys were like can i help you and i said yeah I'm trying to buy I'm trying to buy this single that's in this magazine and you guys were like we don't really sell them here but we can sell you them mm -hmm. and as we were making the transaction it was either you or jonathan i can't remember it might have been jonathan i i don't know my memory uh lags me but you guys just started taking an interest, like shooting the shit with me and being like, you know, what are you up to? Why, you know, I made it yeah. interesting enough to ask what my story was and what the hell I was doing there. And I basically was a record fiend. I was the crack addict for, for records. So um, 
And as I was in there, you guys said, oh, yeah, well, we're, we're thinking about, you know, doing something with our logo. And we've had this logo and you pointed it out. And I was familiar with it because I've been in New York for, for a, like a month or two. And I had been to one of at least one of the parties or whatever. And it was the old, you know, jumping graphic from the old posters. You had the giant step in the V. And you said, you know, I'd love to do something with it. And I don't know why I had such urgency. But as soon as I left there, I felt like you guys hired me. Like, I felt like you were like, why don't you take a shot? Or Jonathan was like, why don't you take a shot? And, you know, would it just check back in with us, show us what you can do. And I told you I was a graphic designer yeah. and I was an illustrator. And I don't know if I even made it, might have shown you something. I don't know. No, I, don't I, know. I remember you, after we told you that, because we were doing the club at Metropolis at that point. Yeah. You came down to Metropolis yeah. and you were the first one there. And we'll talk about why you were there so early <laughs> in a minute. Yeah. Um, and you had a sketchbook and you were sketching, you were like playing yeah. with the, the, and you did a, and even that evening, I remember you did a very early version. You showed me a very early version. You, you had lots yeah, of Yeah, before I left, I had, I had at least, I'm like, I'm going to show them at least a, a sketch. Like yeah. I really thought I was actually working for you. Like yeah, you were. I know, but I, it wasn't like, it was a weird scenario. Like when I think back on it, I was just like totally hustling and thinking that I had a job. Everyone was no hustling. No guarantees or anything. Yeah, I was, was just hustling. like making something in the club while listening to the music. And, uh, and then literally, I think it was the next day or maybe the day after. It was like within 24 hours, Very I had quick. nailed it in my own brain. Yep. I had nailed it. I was a child who like had no idea what I was doing, but I had this idea of my three sons and that's where the idea came from. The illustration of the feet of my three sons. And I don't know how I translated that into giant step, but somehow the knobs on the horn became those feet type of thing. And I felt like if you could illustrate the giant step into a horn of some sort, if you could get the whole word into a horn and that all that complicated business in between the end of the, you know, the, the mouthpiece of a trumpet and the horn of the trumpet, if you could get all the graphics in there, that would be insane. And, and so I tried to fit it in there and I was doing it very much in the blue note, hand cut, read miles type of thing. I was thinking of Swifty a little bit, of course, but he was doing the jagged cuts cause he was working on computer too. And I don't know what it was. I just felt like there's something about this 50s, 60s thing. And I felt I had something and I brought it back to you guys and you guys were psyched on it. And I don't know the conversation that you had behind my back. Like, what you, were you like, this kid's crazy, but I kind of like this logo. Or Loved is this it. better than anything we have? And The only thing we changed um, was yeah. we took the head off the trump, the, the end off the trumpet. Yeah. That and that was that was crucial because it was a bit horsey like it, it was hard to fit on stuff and it was hard, definitely hard to fit yeah. in the corner of a flyer or something like that so there was a there was a reason for that but it did for me it was a little bit like now it doesn't look like a horn you know i i was all pissy about it but you guys also were like hey i'll give you 300 bucks and i was like yes yeah yeah i can buy Gold. pizza and records now <laughs> and i can get into the club you were like come anytime to the club and i, I met afraid. mark bell there yeah. because mark labelle mm -hmm. was working for you yeah so he was like another friend and he introduced me to mervyn seeley and this other friend yeah, and Merv, then I was yeah, like, yeah yeah i was like down with everybody and so i was like damn and i even made this thing which i still have today and i i, I need to find it at some point when i do i'll send it to you morris um I actually made a, I sent the logo because I was worried about you guys kind of ripping me off or something. Right. I, I don't know. So I did the cheap person's copyright and I mailed it to myself at my friend's apartment that I didn't even belong in. Um, I was basically sleeping on the floor. And if I didn't make it home by midnight, I couldn't sleep there. Type right. of thing. And so I mailed it to myself and I still have that sealed envelope in case you guys ever were to screw me out of my $300. So right. I, was like, I was prepared and I thought I was super professional. But when you guys took it, I was just like, 
I was like so elated. I was elated about the money. I was elated that I got accepted into it and it got it got accepted. But I never even thought about like, am I going to clean it up or anything? I gave you a physical copy. Like it was a drawing that you guys then would scan and eventually scan, but would cut up and, you know, put on flyers. And then when you started the first two years, if you look at all the flyers from 92 and 93, it was a slow build because some nights you were still just putting giant step mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the Groove Academy logo was up there. And then I started seeing the giant step up there and I was like, holy shit, like they're really going to use this thing. Yeah. And then you showed me the t-shirt, which actually was the outline. It wasn't even yep. the filled version. And you did a t-shirt for your Japanese tour. Yep. Wow, you, that, you've got a better memory than me, Kevin. I know, and it was navy blue with a cream logo on it. Correct. That jazz it up on the back, on Correct. the bib. And we, and we, had, we had a discussion a few months ago where I was telling you that Shepard produced those T-shirts because that was the first time I'd met Shepard. Right. And you reminded me that Shepard didn't do our first T-shirts. No. He, he did the second round of T-shirts. Yeah. So, yeah. And he did the, like, camo... He like he camoized it and he did all the like flexing yeah. of it, and that was cool but the first t-shirt i don't know where you printed it but it wasn't it was yeah. like you know you guys just needed a box to take to yeah to take to japan yeah, yeah. Um, so that was I, like for I, me I think, the, and i had still have that t-shirt it's a long sleeve wow blue i, I still don't. have that and it's in pretty good condition yeah. too i gotta find that too i, I, gotta I think all i think you've, you've you've hit on something that's very interesting just the method of executing design back then, which this is pre-computers, it was hand-drawn, it was cutting out. I mean, just talk a little, because that is an art form. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I was lucky because I, generationally, I sort of missed the computer thing. And that's where Eben comes in, quite honestly, because Eben was learning like programs and computer graphics. and. I spent a half a year in graphic design and I got very bored with it and I went into animation. So I never got the education on the computer. So I was very used to like hand drawing everything, but it was very difficult because you would spend a lot of time at Kinko's blowing stuff up, making it bigger then going back in and redrawing it and cleaning it up. It was the way that it was done. And then you would do these very timely paste ups. And if you had a spelling error, you would have to go all the way back and do it all over again. It was not as easy as making a, a computer fix like this. The one advantage of that is that people don't change things at the last second back then. Because right. you were like, fuck it's it. Hard. Yeah. It's got to run <laughs> yeah. and we got to yeah. copy it. And the beauty of flyers was, um, the beauty of flyers really was, was that you could photocopying flyers was part of the gig, right? There was a lot of photocopied giant set flyers, then there was a lot of printed stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was very like, it was very forgiving to the medium of like doing photocopies and stuff. So I would spend the day drawing, then going to Kinko's, sitting outside of NYU, drawing more, cleaning it up, going back in there, then scanning it down to size and then putting the letter forms in and using either you know, photocopy letter forms and stuff. And, you know, it, that was a process in and of itself. And, but, you know, at the time you didn't think it was, you, it was normal. It wasn't. Yeah. And then when Eben started using the computer and freehand and started making stuff, well, then you started to get a more original feel. And we were able to do some flyers for you that were different, like the MC Solar flyer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was like cut out. It was drawn by me, but then, put in the computer and then scanned and then cut out and done the right way. And then some of the big music seminar flyers were done that way. Like the, the, the one with uh, yeah, Russell. Yeah. Roland yeah Kirk. Russell Roland Kirk on it, which is 93. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very good memory. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 93. And that, that was great because Eben was very good at that. And Eben just took off from there. Like he became, mm -hmm. you know, he started doing magazines and everything else. Um, uh, Jamil GS, yes, the Eb shout. There's a um, lot of heads on this, by the way. Yeah, I, I a see Raoul. I see a lot of Tyler, a lot of people I that see, used to. Yeah, yeah, them, so. yeah. But um, um yeah, it was okay. amazing. I, I think the, to your point, the way that people communicated, and talked to each other, and jobs were hooked up, were so much different, right? It was so much. It wasn't a. Uh, you had to meet in person. 
You had to deliver the thing in person. You had to talk to people. You had to see people. You had to experience that all the time. And I think there was something like, that's how I met everyone that I love, you know? Like everyone that I, I met was through these visceral connections that we meet. So you meet one guy and it translates into 15 yep. other guys. And then you yep. meet one person and it goes, yep. yeah, analog lifestyle. Yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you, you and, and you had to know. I mean, it, if you didn't know, you didn't know. It was, it was right. really that clear. I mean, yeah. it was the same with the music. You know, you wouldn't know about these types of music unless you were going to Rebel Rebel or unless you were going to the club or unless you were listening to certain DJs, which gets us actually to, 100%. before we move on to the other stuff, I just want to just, you to tell the story of why you would only come to Giant Step early and leave early. Well, there's a couple of <laughs> reasons for that. But the big reason was mm -hmm. always because Giant Step was on Thursday nights. I was not a drinker. I right. have never been a drinker um, and I'm not necessarily a dancer. I was there to hear the music. I was an audiophile. I was there to, to hear the music. And so I would always come early because I didn't want to miss anything. That right. was one of the big things. I also, there was a secret part of me at 20 years old who felt like if I showed up when everyone else did, they're not going to let me in. Right. And the bouncers would always let me in because I was that kid who did right. the giant step logo and he's here early. Right. Yeah. The other part of it and where I missed and sometimes in my darkest moments, I might regret a Roots performance that I missed or something else. I would miss some of the key late night people because I would rush home to record Bobito and Stretch on on uh, WKCR. So, which was also on a Thursday. Which was also so, yeah, on Thursday yeah. night. And so I had I was in my backpack were my tapes that I had bought that day. And then I was headed home and I would draw and I would like figure out basically like, I would figure out exactly when I could leave the club and get there. And people must have seen me leaving and been like, the guru's coming. <laughs> and I would hear the rumors as I'm there. Like even LaBelle would come over. He's like, yo, guru's coming by. And he's bringing like blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, yeah, but Stretch and Bob are going on. And what if like Nas shows up or something? Because right. I was still so deeply a hip hop head. Um, and live performances to me now, I would kill for that to see that performance. But at the time, it was always like the next hustle. Like I needed those tapes to live through the next four days because I would basically walk around my yellow Sony Walkman and listen to the tapes all all, all week. Now and, I have 50 downloads from 50 different DJs. But And the, yeah, those were the days where you'd have to press play at the right time or else you would miss that moment and that moment would be Yeah, I mean, the fact that on, on uh, Giles Peterson did an insane mix this morning, which you could only get from going to Giant Step at a club that you couldn't even download, like, I actually listened to one of the best sets by Giles Peterson this morning as he's doing an Anita Baker birthday mix. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you couldn't get that ever. And then tomorrow I could listen to a totally different mix. But back then you were sweating what was actually happening. So it was like, you know, and that was the thing. And I wanted, and you told the story as well, why there isn't a lot of film that <laughs> happened at Stretch and Bob's. Yeah. <laughs> because... Nick, Nick, yeah, yeah Nick, Quest, Nick his who, roommate was his roommate at Giant Step because the little girls there, and there were yeah, no girls up at uh, KC, uh, uh, WKCR. Yeah, right. Stretch was not yeah. dateable at that time for him, so <laughs> he was off the market. Um, but yeah, and that was, I mean, but Thursday nights were like everything to me. Like that was like a holiday every week for me because. It was giant step. And then during that week, it would either be making a flyer for it or making a banner that would hang behind the DJs. And then I'd go there and like, I'd be able to take pictures with like Jazzy Nice DJ, I've, you know, like in front of the banner or whatever, someone else would post mm -hmm. a photo. And then, and then again, I would meet so many people in there that like, that it just became like this visceral connection of like, Hey, do you want to go to the, you know, someone would come up and be like, do you want to be in the background of the diggable planets video on Wednesday? Because everybody who was shooting music videos would come to giant step and pick out all the people to put in the background of their videos, you know? And it was like this wild, weird subculture that was there, you know? Um, 
the, the, the talk is awesome. We're going, ver, ver, the time is going very, very quickly. I, I want to just move on to a couple of other things before we go into your sort of like creative, you know, story and also uh, obviously the, the, the iconic monster. I want to just touch very briefly on Triple Five Soul because that is a, a company that was a, very much a part of early Giant Step and also a part of your early career as well. So talk a little bit about that and because that must have had a big influence on you too, besides meeting the people you met, but the actual work that you did. Yeah, well, I mean, luckily Camilla is a, still a good friend to this day and I, I respect tremendously what she did. And I think, you know, she often gets overlooked. She is the queen of streetwear. Yep, absolutely. No and yep. because of the way that the world has changed, like as soon as she sort of got big and then out of the game, social media blew up. So it, yep. it never like, that's where some people believe streetwear began at this right. certain yeah. time where social yeah. media hit. Mm -hmm. But what she had was a vibe, right? Like she had, and um, what's his name that would do your parties a lot? Uh, Jamalski, I mm -hmm. mean, Jamalski was part of like, music was part of her culture because she was dressing all De La Soul and hip hop. Tribe, and everybody. Yeah, yeah and yeah. when I met her, I mean, Eben was working closely with her. I can't say that my career really, I did a few things with her and I did, I did some work with Eben. Um, so we did work together, but he was primarily that, or the art director for that, um, at near like that, that period around 92, 93, 94. Um, I did a few things, uh, definitely a few things with him for sure. But, um, but her influence was great because I saw someone who was creating the scene herself. Like she had the shop that had PMB nation yeah. that had not from concentrate that, you know, two black guys was down the street. She was carrying Sir. And that was yep. the first time I had ever seen Russell's stuff. The first time I met Sung from PMB and yep. that crew. And PMB was my brand. That was my brand. Like I had, I have every t-shirt. I still have the Don's shorts and tank top. Wow. And like every, I was vegetarian. So I was like, right. I love that they're- Totally like, down with that logo, yeah. yeah. And so- for me, that was like my favorite shit. And also it was like photocopy pig and everything else. And then, and then Camilla actually gave me a job. I worked in the shop on Sundays uh, during the summer when was I- Was that when it was on uh, Ludlow? Yeah, that was yeah. on Ludlow. Mm -hmm. So it was 94, 95, maybe the summers after mm -hmm. I, I would come back from California. And then I was, when I was in California, Julie Z mm -hmm. owned the, the shop out there. And so I'd work out there on Saturdays, like covering for people um and that's where i started really work with russ and sir and 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 we started to work together which would last another 10 years but camilla i respect so much in that scene she really gave a, a store this was before even like james was just opening mm -hmm. union then and but camilla had the brands i mean it mm -hmm. was the little shop and it was on ludlow and it was lower east side and, and ludlow was nothing back then i mean it was yeah. well, not nothing but it she it, was no, kind it of was. the first I mean, it was she was pretty the, much yeah. It was pretty much like an artist. You had that the sombrero, and... you had the hats, and you, I think, it, Mac, not even sure if Max Fish was even open back then. No, no, um, not yeah. yet. And, and Triple Five Soul and Ludlow yeah, and Stanton. Yeah, Two Black but... Eyes, which often gets mm -hmm. overlooked. That was like mm -hmm. two doors down. Um, the Canadian guys, who's like a real estate guy in Toronto now. But, um, but yeah, that, I mean, that store was magic to me, and I loved working in there on Sundays and listening to the music. And also the Jibo tapes. Yeah, um, Jibo the Pro. The yep. Jibo the Pro, like those mm -hmm. tapes, like, and the amount of mixtapes that she sold at the store, that was another gateway to music. So everything was sort of inspired by that. I mean, I love graphic design, but everything was that way, the way to be part of the music industry in some shape or form. And I was very much like, I, you know, Evan and I both, I think we had this idea. I mean, he went on to do stress magazine, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we had this idea that like hip hop, like after Hayes had sort of done his iconic stuff, like hip hop had sort of fallen short, like album covers were starting to be really like industry driven. And with the exception of like the drawing board and then maybe the far side and freestyle fellowship and they're, them using slick out in LA, like we thought we could, you know, we, I personally thought I could like change everything and work in the music industry and become an art director and make album covers. And suddenly streetwear just popped. And like that, 
took me to another place because that was about sampling and appropriation and like logo flips and stuff like that. And for some reason, that's always what I love to do. So the music, the music was part of that culture because we would rip on music lyrics and put music lyrics on tees and hip hop sayings. And, but it was always like, you sort of spun out of, you spun out of, um, you know, that a little bit. And so I suddenly went into streetwear a little bit more and that took me on a different path. And, you know, I can't, I, I don't regret that at all, but it was very different than music. And I felt like I could express myself more than trying to join like a record company and influence that and that type of thing. Glad you didn't. You would have, you would have just been, you would have left a broken man. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that, there was know, no Eric still did was, great things was, over the but, years, but he was always a hired gun. No. Correct. And there yeah. was no, and at the time we're talking about, there was no creativity at the labels at all. It was yeah. just, yeah, no, the, the majors, I should say. Um, uh, so as I said, we're a little tight on time. We have so much more I want to cover. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, do, do you want to, do you want to talk about um, your time with Russ? Do you want to go into, uh, I mean, you, what, you know, what, what, no, where, I, I, I think, you know, we had a brief conversation uh, last week about this talk. I mean, I do think that is, it's important to note the people that came out of that experience, whether it be yes. the streetwear, like the people who frequented Giant Step with me have all, and, and who were around there, like the Mark LaBelle's who went on right. to work for Eminem, like myself yep. who went on to do this stuff, like Evan who went on and become an artist and moved to yep. Germany and come back and like, you know, the photographers that were there, the the artists who went on to bigger and better things, like started there and like the roots and stuff like that, and a ton of others. It, you know, I think it's interesting that that was sort of the proving grounds, that was sort of the, the, the nurturing that it took. And I think doing something on your own, m putting a stake in the music industry on your own terms, Camilla putting herself in, stake in the ground in her own terms, stash and future of making a store creating an environment creating brands um we you know russ who was hugely influence influential on me meeting someone like james jebby at an early age and 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 all those guys like and you know eddie cruz out in la and like mm -hmm. these influences like they were built from a very small foundation and then they sort of come out and become this other thing and and as that happens I think it's interesting because my career has taken many turns, but the 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 um, the constant is always the people that that were around me or or within that. And even though I'm now doing like monsters and right. making these illustrations and characters, like they're they're still somewhat influenced by what I grew up in. Like the monsters themselves were generated from years of watching Sesame Street and Jim Henson um, and and Garfield and all this other stuff, but the attitude of them, the swagger of them, the disgruntledness, the bluntedness, the the yelling, the screaming, that comes from the culture that I grew up in, which is like this culture of like in your face, we're gonna do it at any co cost, we're gonna like build and move forward. And that was like a super important step in my life. So like uh, Jamil just, he keeps reminding me of everything, but like natural born has been mentioned a couple of times. And when I started working with Russ and doing sir, like for years we were working together, but I also had some ideas and I was still on this sort of backpack hip hop thing. And, you know, I started making this brand called natural born, which Russ supported tremendously and was like, Hey, let's, let's put this line out. I'll, I'll help distribute it. And he was super supportive and we did some projects together, but like Russ was on this very like, you know, movie gangster Russian, you know, kind of vibe with, with hip hop, a harder part of hip hop. And then I started doing this more crunchy sort of, you know, earth meets uh, hip hop mm -hmm. kind of thing with like different influences around me. Like the, the music, I pulled a lot of music, um, Archie Shep, you know, quotes, mm -hmm. pulled stuff off album covers um and went into natural born and that gave me the confidence i think to start to think of myself as like an independent artist um because i think for years either working for you even with eben and doing 
a little bit of triple five soul here working for Russ. I was always, I felt like I was always in the background and I was very mm -hmm. comfortable in the background for a lot of years. Like I didn't stress that. I felt like I was part of what I was doing. People respected me for who I was, but I, I never really thought about building the name. And then when I started to try to do that, I was like, damn, I should have been building my name <laughs> earlier. But I think it just, it, it brought itself like things sort of rise to the top. Yeah. I think good things take time. Yeah. Good things take time for me. And I, I like I said, I wasn't, I didn't hang out a lot. I, I was not a, I, I didn't party very much. And I so, never remember seeing you. Yeah. Like, I know people. I'm yeah, just yeah. a weird, I, I'm a bit of anomaly in that sense of like, I, you know, I mean, people used to make fun of me and running shorts, running to the office. Or, I mean, guys like Aaron or Kiernan, they would just bust on me for wearing, you know, high running shorts. And now, there's running clubs all over yeah, the world and right. daddy dark from Attica blues runs yeah. the run dem crew and like, and that's how everybody's, I everybody's running. Yeah. Running. Yeah. Yeah. I have all, that, every yeah. album he ever made. And I met him through running 25 years after I bought the first Attica blues record, you know? And so for me, you know, this has been an, a journey that continues and, and, you know, people come and go, but they all kind of meet back in the middle, you know? And the fact that I'm still friends with just about everybody I knew, except for a few that sadly passed, uh, you know, is super cool. I was in Hawaii just last year and Mark LaBelle comes with Eminem. They perform live and he comes by the wall that I'm painting, you know? Wow. You start shooting this shit like it was like we were on Barrick Street again. So it's those types of things that you're like, whoa, what's going on? Oh, there's Daddy Die. Yeah, there he wow. is. Yeah. Attica Blues in the house, just talking about you too. But yeah, that, I mean, that's phenomenal. I got to run with him in London and right. he's probably thinking like, oh yeah, he wants to run with me. And I, the whole time I'm running with him and he, it was a hard run. He was having right. us do hills up this parking garage and he kept giving me shit. Like, he, if you want to run the marathon like that, you're going to have to do hills. And then I thought, I'm running with a guy from Attica Blues. <laughs> whole time I'm <laughs> yeah. getting out on Attica Blues. And it's like, you know, there's certain people that I geek out on and that was one of them. And it was not like anything to do with what he was doing then. I was like, he was in a past that, you know, I bought his record with with money that I should have spent on food right. or rent or something else. But and I have all the records, every Attica Blues. Released, so so um, I, I want to hear what you have planned for the future because um, you know, you're constantly creating, innovating, and it'd be great to tell people, you know, what, what is, what is next for you? What, what are you working on? Yeah. Well, I mean, the pandemic has put, because I do so many live things like murals and I do appearance, like I go and like, I do a collaboration and then I go there and I paint a mural and I do all this other stuff. There was, I, I took a hit in the years, in the year that was, um, yeah. But what's interesting is that there's been new opportunities and there's uh, like, I'm about to come out with a collection of kids wear for, for a brand. And, um, and it's going to come out at the latter half of this year. It's already been developed and everything. And it's going to be like the biggest global collection I've ever done. And it's for kids. And nice. it's, it's, you know, it's going to be an amazing collection that like I've been moving closer and close. I started the monsters because I had my daughters and I used to draw the monsters for them. And then the monsters started to take shape and then comes along like Colette and things like that. Um, and I, I have been gravitating more and more towards a younger audience. Like the monsters appeal to people of all ages and the monsters have really taken over for Kevin Lyons. Like people can appreciate the monsters and not know who I am. Yeah, and I've been yeah. really, cognizant of that and at first you think that's a little bit of like oh, I, I need to get credit for it I need to build my name and then I start to think like you know a lot of people don't know who Jim Davis is they know who Garfield is and I'm not at all comparing myself to Jim Davis or Garfield or anything else but the idea that the the characters themselves can outlive the artist and that they that's can show up brilliant and, and like I did this deal with Jolly Rancher Candies I made the the characters they're in the logo of Jolly Rancher and they've been out for like two and a half years and people geek out on them because they're in airports and the logo and everything. And what's interesting about that is like, if you had told me as a kid, you were going to make like a cereal package 
or or candy or something like that i was like i would be like insanely like jazzed about that i would be like that would be through the roof type of thing and so when it happens like i know it's a morbid thing to say but when you're dead and gone like your kids are walking through an airport your grandkids are walking through an airport and they're like there's the graphics so it's that idea of like what you can do with some of this stuff and then the monsters have taken hold so that's a big thing that's going to happen at the end of 2021 going into 2022 i wish i could say more about it but it's going to be fun and it's for kids it's for 14 and under and it's going to be really big and that's going to be really special because i've never done a, such a big global launch i've done a lot of launches um a lot of uh you know, limited edition products, which a lot of us artists do. So to do something that mass and that big in the world um, will be interesting. And also for an audience that only appreciates the graphics, you know, that mm -hmm. they're not, that it's not like, oh, this kid's going to buy it because it's Kevin Lyons. The kid's going to buy it because they love the graphic. And that's, that's kind of the goal in, in many ways. You get to the point where you don't need to be the face or the voice behind it, but You've and then created. I want to do I want to yeah. do small projects. I want to do personal things, uh, you know. And I do want to, uh, you know, continue working. I flirt with art all the time with the monsters. It's just not necessarily. I haven't been motivated to go into that world, but it's something that always hangs over my head. So, but um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm very content with what I'm doing, and then plugging forward. And so, you know. I'm excited uh, to keep to keep pushing in and keep working on the stuff. I mean, the monsters are a beast unto themselves. They're yeah, busy I mean, all they've taken own. a whole life of their own. They um, have, and, yeah. and it was totally unplanned, and it is just taken off. And a lot of people to thank for that too. You know, a lot of people put like Colette, Sarah mm -hmm. from Colette was a, just such a huge supporter. Um, Pedro Winter, that whole French. Yeah really put it on the international map. And then there's been so many brands and so many people that have repped it. So it's kind of, but it's weird to be so different from the graphic design. To become an illustrator was a weird transition for me. Cause I'm still, I draw everything like it's a graphic. Right. Everything is a logo. That's my mentality for everything I do. And it, it's painstaking sometimes, so. <laughs> well, Kevin, um, we, we, unfortunately, we're running out of time. This That's fine. This is great. This has been absolutely awesome. I mean, yeah. your your story is incredible, and also, y you know, your logo. I mean, it, it still looks the logo you did for us. We still use it. It's as fresh today as it was when yeah. you designed it. The other thing I love about it, which I'll say very quickly, is you can have it big, you can have it small, and it still looks incredible. And that is amazing because there's very few logos that I've seen that you literally, this, you know, looks as good small as it does big. Yeah. So and that's total kudos. I, as well. And I appreciate the opportunity. It was a tremendous, uh, like you guys trusted me, you and Jonathan have both given me credit through the years, which doesn't happen with a lot of logos. I feel well, like we, we didn't design it. <laughs> I, I know can't even draw. you guys have always, every article, my yeah. name winds up in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that I've told Jonathan this too, when I saw him in LA once, I, I was like, it, it doesn't happen all the time. I've done other logos that don't wind up getting credit mm -hmm. for a lot of stuff. And you guys have always been a supporter of that. I also have really enjoyed the 30th anniversary link. Thank you. All the playlists. And I encourage you. anyone on this mix, yeah. uh, anyone on this yeah. uh, Instagram live to go and listen to the music because the music is everything. And the logo is only a small portion of that because the music and the musicians were incredible. Yeah. So. Th thank you for that. And uh, yeah, go to uh, our, our vault at giantstep.net. And we're, I'm going to be back next week uh, uh, on Thursday, I think it's February the 4th, with Alice Arnold, who did all the oh, iconic pictures. Oh, who took the pictures. photo yeah. that I posted iconic today. Pi exactly, all the iconic pictures. Nice. So. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We've had some great people uh, tuning in from all over the world. Sweden, London, yeah, yeah. New York. All thank over. you to everybody who yeah. tuned in and everyone who chatted it up. I read yeah. everything, but yeah. um, it was hard to comment on everything. But, yeah, there's some good heads on here and a lot yeah. of people I love. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone stay safe. Yes. Bye. Peace. Jazz it up. <laughs>